I'd love to welcome up our controller, Scott Stringer. Well, it's good, to, it's good to be on the west side and to see all of you, and I'm very excited about the forum tonight, and I really want to just recognize uh, the members of the Upper West Side Save Our Stores. Give them a big round of applause, because this is, this is a really big turnout, and it's a very important issue. And for any of us who travel this city, what's becoming painfully obvious is that our small businesses are just leaving us. And we are quickly becoming what we spent basically a lifetime trying not to be, a city that does not promote the most creative entrepreneurship in New York. And for those of you who have been around and seen the city at its worst times, we remember that one of the strategies about making people feel safe back in the 70s, 80s, and 90s was the vitality of the commercial space. Keep the lights on, keep the traffic coming, more young people, more seniors will feel that they can travel the city. And obviously that has become a key component to the way we live our lives in New York. I'm here tonight because one of the ways as controller I want to tackle this issue is to give you a sense about where we really stand in terms of the retail vacancy rates in the city. And so our report is going to just focus on some of the issues that matter in terms of retail vacancy. And I want you to have this knowledge because as legislators in the council, the assembly, state senate, craft solutions, we really have to, for the first time, look at the totality of some of the real issues facing us. It's not enough just to bemoan it, we actually have to figure out the retail economy in the city. So let me just give you some data on the report that we issued about retail vacancy in New York. First of all, our report found that rents have written, risen as much as 68% on the Upper West Side. The amount of vacant storefront space has doubled since 2007 from around 6 million square feet to over 11.7 million square feet. Our vacancy rate in the last 10 years rose by 45% from 2007 to 2017 to nearly 6%. Think about it, close to 12 million square feet, double the amount. Now, Manhattan neighborhoods account for half of the 20 neighborhoods with the most empty square footage. That includes Chelsea, Greenwich Village, and even along Fifth Avenue. Rise, uh, rents are rising on the ground floor by 22% on average from 2007 to 2017. This is mostly hurting our mom and pop sh shops. And rents rose fastest in Manhattan, sometimes doubling. Between 20, uh, 2007 and 2017, the number of, uh, this is something interesting, right? From 2007 to 2017, the number of service businesses rose by nearly 50%. Bars and restaurants soared 65%. Bookstores and pharmacies are being replaced by cafes and bars. Flower shops are being replaced by doggy daycare. <laughs> no, no, this is, uh, we're, gonna get to, we're gonna get to doggy daycare. There's a, there's a point in doggy daycare. Um, so doggy daycare and barber shops. And the reason this is happening, according to our analysis, is there's a basic change in how people shop. It's called the Amazon effect. And it is one of the leading contributing cause of retail vacancy in New York City. And part of it is that as habits change, we now are seeing harder times for some of those bookstores and clothing stores that we love because you can just go online, do the retail thing, and the reason service industry stores are doing well, like doggy daycare, is because Amazon hasn't figured out how to get your dog home from a wash that they could do and mail the dog back in the evening, right? So, so this is, you know, that's why childcare does so well, because they haven't figured out mechanically how to deal with kids. So that's all good, by the way. So you have, you basically have a fundamental change in the way people shop. And the neighborhoods that we look at is not just Manhattan, but we have places, vacancy rates, Queens and Staten Island. Part of what our strategy has to encompass is one, 
to start dealing with the changing retail environment, but developing those strategies. So here's something that we're looking at very closely. So we know that there are certain industries because of online shopping that may not do well, right? And so part of what we have to do as a city government is align the buildings department and the consumer affairs department and the department of finance to make sure that as businesses come in that are service oriented, that the permitting process, the leasing process, the tax <laughs> process has to be made to shift quickly so that we don't have space languish, right? There's no reason when you see data like this to see that service stores are actually marketing and possible, we should try to move those small businesses rather than throw up our hands and say, well, you know, it's the Amazon effect, right? So that is one strategy that the city government has to do. The second part of the equation there is we as community board members, civic leaders, we have spent, many of you in this room I know for a long time, we have spent many years fighting these tall, out of control, overdevelopment projects on the Upper West Side, taking away our light and air. We come to a community board meeting and we say, hey, wait a minute, I don't want my, I don't want to live in a Second Avenue tunnel and we protest and we fight and the great battle that we had was against Trump, uh, right, many years ago, right, on, in the 70s near Lincoln Towers. And so we don't want that and we fight that. The second thing we want to say is, hey, we don't just want luxury apartments, right? We want housing for everybody. We want affordable housing. So we come to the Community Board, City Planning Commission, and we say we want that, and we have won our share of those battles. But honestly, and I can tell you this as borough president and serving in the assembly, the last thing we strategize about is the commercial space, the retail space. We almost take it for granted that you're gonna get a Dwayne Reed, another Dwayne Reed, <laughs> a Chase Bank and a Citibank, right? And then there's gonna be a little store that sells something. And then we go on with our lives. We can't do that anymore. So we have to make sure that we have a strategy by community that demands of these developers that it is not enough for you to contact stores from faraway places, drugstores and others, companies that really don't even do business here, but actually take advantage of our land use process, and we have to start demanding what we want as far as our community planning process. So when we go to uh, Linda uh, or um, Helen and we say, look, we want more than just the building to be lower. We, need, we want to round table out how we start focusing on that. Gail Brewer has had ideas on this as borough president, but we really should now look at this report and do this. And finally, I want to just mention that in addition to these issues, where do we go from here? And I happen to think everything has to be on the table. We can no longer dictate, no longer dictate from the powers that be how our neighborhoods will be created. That is up to us. And for too long, and for too long, Bob Jackson has been a lone voice because he said it, commercial rent control, you know, and all of these bad <laughs> words that you're not allowed to do, that it's time for us to put everything on the table. Legislation, strategies, because if we don't do this, then this city is going to become sanitized, we're gonna to continue to have vacancies, and it would be a missed opportunity to not bring the city together and say, look, we know there's a crisis, we know the data, but we're not gonna surrender to the Amazons and technology, we actually wanna build community. And lastly, because I crunch numbers more than I do land use nowadays, what's at stake here is we wanna continue to bring people from all over the world here. We have 62 million tourists, we need to create opportunities for economic activity. And if we don't have a diversified economy at the most local level, then these neighborhoods that we love and cherish are gonna look very much different. And for all of us who spent our, a lifetime protecting the Upper West Side and communities like it, uh, it's something that we cannot stand for. So I hope you read this report. I'm happy to be here to answer questions going forward. The staff's gonna be here tonight. Normally I would stay, but you know, as the problem with my job now is I get to do 10 minutes and then leave, but I do have time. Yes, I have time for questions because it's the Upper West Side. And, uh, yeah. But thank you all very much. It's great to be here today. Thank you. Thank you.
Yes, sir. So, question from the audience. One is, vacant, vacancy is one issue. You, you talked about looking at the community and what their needs are. How would you go about how would you go about determining what those needs are for a particular community? And let's talk about the Upper West Side. And what we've seen is, is that almost every 10 blocks, it's a different community. So how would you go about doing that? And since we are a pretty wealthy community, would we get the advantages or the benefits of what you would offer in terms of supporting the businesses in that community? Are you thinking of a an 80-20 kind of situation like you do with housing? What would, how would you go about making sure that you get the businesses we need? So, you know, one of, one of the, the research that Bob has done um, is pretty compelling how you would craft a, craft a legislative initiative. And I'm going to just defer to him because of his, you know, 10 years of knowledge. But in the time that I have here, I want to say what, what, what you mentioned, which is very serious. We have got to go back to something we used to do, and quite frankly, the West Side has led the way. It's called community-based planning, and it starts with the community board and civic organizations, putting forth a community plan. We need to create in this city a larger five-borough plan because there's more that unites us in different neighborhoods that divide us, and as this report shows, this isn't a Manhattan-centric problem. This is a Staten Island problem and a Queens problem. The problem with this administration is they have a top-down approach, not just on this issue, but on issues of land use and zoning and affordable housing. They come to a community and they tell you what they're going to do to you, or I mean, with you, for you. Um, <laughs> you got that, right? So they come in and they believe that's the end of the planning process. That is not true. We need to create opportunities for community boards to have a say. We also need to think differently about the resources that communities need. I've always said that a community board has fundamentally changed. It's no longer a service delivery operation, right? Community boards don't really fill potholes or take care of housing complaints. That's what our legislators do now. So what the planning board should do, what the community board should do, is become the community planning board, which, what it, which, what it, which it used to be. We need to have land use people on staff to make sure that we could do the kind of analysis we did in the controller's office so that we can plan for our community. And that, to me, is the number one ask right now. The West Side is changing. We know the stores. We know the crises. We need to come up with our ideas to present to the council, to present to the mayor, and we have to do it as one big community. And yes, we have diversity beyond you know, sort of beyond this room, we have to reach out to people, whether it's public housing or Michelama buildings, and build a broad coalition. And whether you support legislation in the council or you support changing the land use process, this is something that we must do. <laughs> okay, so um, I'm going to ask you two different ones that came uh, from it's okay. various people. You had a report on the creative economy recently that came out. And um, what you suggested that was New York should reinvest in this sector. It employs nearly 300,000 New Yorkers and spurs $110 billion in economic activity. But meanwhile, the Upper West Side, which is the home of so many cultural institutions, lost more creative residents than any other neighborhood in the city. And unfortunately, I was the one who informed you of that, so I apologize. Yes, that, that, com that comes that straight from your report. Oh, no, I know. Well, here's the thing. Would you envision how how could the Upper West Side become an arts district again and cre and and add to that creative sector? Could you envi envision us being an arts district? And it goes along with another question that came up. We don't have a bid in in a good section of the Upper West Side. There's one in Lincoln Square. Mm -hmm. There's one in uh, Columbus up to 82nd. There's one above 96 on Amsterdam and uh, Columbus. Um, how would sections of the U.S. be designated a business development area, or do we forget about the bid and, and do it some other way? So they're very related in that how do we manage to rethink the Upper West Side. Well, I love what you said. How do we create a bid in the U.S., meaning this is the center of the universe, right? So I love that. Right? We are the U.S. It starts we with are the heart US. of America. We are the U.S. Uh, so, so, uh, so a couple of things. So the report that we did on the creative economy to show how important arts and culture, uh, not just to attend, but to also realize how much it drives the economy. 
our small theaters, our big theaters, our not-for-profits, the people who work in the back of the house as well as the front of the house. This is part of the dynamic of the city, and we need to have strategies on a number of different levels. First, if we're going to have employees in arts and culture, we have got to create a city where the entrance fee to coming here and staying here is not a $2 million condominium. That's first and foremost. So we need a housing plan that is truly going to do what we've done in the past, which is to build affordable, real affordable housing in all of our communities. The housing that we're building today under the mayor's plan is basically a compact with Rebney developers. We give them 40-story buildings. They promise 30% affordable housing. The problem is that the affordable is unaffordable in every single community. Why are we giving them the land? So I've said, enough with these rezonings. Let's create a program like Mitchell Lama and other programs that created opportunities for people to raise their families and lift themselves up. And by the way, that's what public housing was about when LaGuardia made his deal with Roosevelt and they built public housing. You know about that deal, right? LaGuardia goes to Roosevelt, he cries in the Oval Office, he's tears, they give him money. I always said if de Blasio went to Trump, what would, it, 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 it just wouldn't have been the same thing. So, and in answer to your honest question, is the West Side gonna be the art community today or the artist hub? You know, there was a time when it was, right? Um, when we had a much different kind of neighborhood. But I'm not sure that that should be our focus. The question is, what, it's not so much where, where the artist community is, it's whether we have one in New York City and that we take advantage of the thousand vacant properties the city owns and we don't give them to the big developers. What we do is we harvest that land so some of it can be used for affordable housing, some of it can be used for daycare and childcare sites, some of it can be used for community gardens and some of it can be used for schools and for a real opportunity to plan publicly. And you give that land back to the people. You give it to community-based organizations that know what to do with it, and then we make that a policy. And if we do that, and we create an artist city and a creative economy city, it doesn't matter where we sleep at night, it's where what we do when we get up in the morning. All right. Well, I think that we have to let you go, but we have to move on. And we have lots of other questions for our other guests. I'm excused. So you are. I love you guys. Keep fighting. See you soon. Thank you.